Lost Lancastrian, Episode 7 Solo Dating in the City This episode contains elements that survivors of sexual assault and violence may find disturbing. This story is really about one day. A day I took myself out on a date. That could sound a little sad and lonely, but I assure you, it isn't. On the contrary, people often rush to the conflation of alone and loneliness, when they are definitely not the same thing. My time out alone in this city is, more often than not, my time spent with the city. Edinburgh is so much a fantasy realm, like walking through a poem by Byron or Shelley, gilded by evening light and softened by the open greens. Even the grittier parts of the city can hold a romanticism. My evening was not in a grittier part of the city, though. It was around Brunsfield and Lothian Road, close to the Meadows and Edinburgh Castle, respectively. Although the day had begun at a slow pace, mostly just an exercise in excessive book and TV consumption, everything was leading to a long planned evening out. The evening was about as close to a date as you can get while still being alone, an experience that would come with a juxtaposition of emotions, intellectual stimulation and uncomfortable truths while still providing a satisfying experience. This one would highlight to me what a privilege I have in my solo dates. Yet, unlike most of my jaunts and wonders, this one had begun its journey to fruition several months earlier, if not years earlier. Back in October 2023, not long after I'd finally returned to Edinburgh, I also turned 44. This was a strange experience in many ways. For one, it was the grinding realisation that I was now undeniably middle-aged. Something I still can't quite forgive the universe for. Two, I had no real clue how I got here. Of course, by the end of 2023, three years had passed of a kind of blinkered global coma. I'm sure I'm not alone in reaching a point of realising time had just happened, while everything else felt like it was on an uncomfortable glitching VHS pause. For me, getting offered a flat in Edinburgh and then a part-time job less than a week later was the start of emerging out of the three-year pause. Yet for me, it was also an end to what had been more like a six-year pause. I had been in my thirties when I moved away from Edinburgh. I felt like I had a life of possibilities back then. A decision that seemed reasonable and even sensible at the time turned into accidentally strolling into homelessness and chronic unemployment. My parents, three sisters, one of three brothers-in-law, the majority of the kids, and me in my one-bed 60s high-rise apartment. Times like these are some of my parents' proudest and happiest, seeing us all, or nearly all of us, together, even if it's reminiscent of an elephants in minis joke. It was perhaps doubly pleasing to be in the place that was their son's new home, a touch of permanence in my favourite city, a reclamation of my own life. For my sisters, I guess it was more of a relief to just see their little brother getting back on his own two feet. Liz, the eldest of the three, was the sister I'd been staying with. She'd been with me to help decorate and furnish the new place. Lynn, the middle sister, 
is the only one not living in Scotland, and this was a rare trip north for her. Ruth, the youngest sister, lives in the Highlands, and this was a somewhat rare trip south for her. Three sisters, all older than me, all married, two with kids, come to celebrate their little chaotic single dreamer of a brother's 44th birthday. I am very much the baby of the family. It isn't just that all my sisters are older than me, but also how much older they are. My parents had wanted at least one boy, but after three daughters in reasonably quick succession, they'd almost given up. By the time I was born, Ruth was turning six and Liz was nearly ten. All of my sisters are pretty solid Gen Xers, while I sit on the awkward border of Gen X and Millennials. I am the dreaded Xennial. All my sisters were in their teens, or readying to leave home by the time I reached my most formative years, and while I was an aware enough child witnessing their teens, they were mostly absent for mine, distant in space and experience. Ruth, who had spent the first ten years of my life trying to bury me and leave me somewhere I might never be found, was the only one that remained fairly close ironically becoming the sibling closest to me. Liz was always quite assertive, bookish, and slightly uncoordinated, but had an astonishing capability of walking home while reading a book. It surprised no one that she met her husband, Ed, by pouring a pint of beer over his head. It was his pint, and he was blocking her path to her pint, so completely understandable. They married as a requirement when Ed was offered a job in New York and the US wouldn't recognise common law partnerships. It was hardly a fancy affair and they needed to borrow a fiver from a friend to pay the registrar. Liz is now a midwife around Inverclyde where she keeps having call the midwife moments in the smaller communities than she had in Manchester. They moved to Scotland and the West Coast in particular to be closer to their boat, a pastime I can fully get behind. Lynn spent much of her early years desperately wanting to fit in, an 80s teen with crimped blonde hair and garish leggings, like she'd just stepped out of the breakfast club. She tended to bite her tongue more than Liz, holding her frustrations in until breaking point, when she'd explode in a tirade of fury reminiscent to the Taz cartoon of my childhood, We had a house like a colander through her teens, full of holes in the walls and doors, mostly about shin height. So often those little eruptions, when directed at me, were the motivation needed to finally get things done, though. When she moved to Liverpool and trained in theatre wardrobe, Lynn finally let her freak flag fly. She may be something of a Forest of Dean country-dwelling homebody mum of two today, But she still makes costumes for a living. Everything from West End musicals to the latest Marvel blockbuster. Ruth was always the more settled and sensible. She had a tough time at school, particularly secondary school, mostly due to her late diagnosed dyslexia. That led to Ruth having far less of a sense of ambition around her and some questionable boyfriend choices such as the motorcycling metal fan who repeatedly crashed his bikes and with each crash progressed to a bigger, more powerful bike. Then she married an utter waste of space that left her with a baby boy to raise alone. That experience would make her fiercely independent and largely intolerant of bullshit. She trained and worked as a florist while raising that boy and discovered she had something of a latent creative streak and capability. Yet, she still married again, and had three more kids. All boys. Something that puts her in a near constant state of eye-rolling today. Surprisingly, Ruth, who never seemed to have any desire to move far from home, is now living the furthest away in a small east coast town of the Scottish Highlands. You can probably tell that I love all my sisters dearly, and have always somewhat idolised them. They are all so impressive and marvellous to me. I've always felt like the runt of the litter, something that exasperates all of them, 
and they seem to be under the impression that I've always been the brightest, smartest and most promising of the brood. I've never seen it personally. Ruth is so much quicker witted than me. Lynn is so much more organised than me. Liz is so much more daring than me. Even when I was six, I was terrified of the Alice of Wonderland ride at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Lynn often had to go back to the ice cream van to get the change I'd walked away without. And Ruth would fire the retort it would otherwise have taken me a week of obsessing over before realising. About the only thing I identify as being positives about myself have been my endless curiosity and an immediate instinct to stand up against bullies. There is also the ridiculous capacity for remembering vast quantities of utterly useless information too. Something that has come in handy at the occasional pub quiz. Mostly though, I'm continuously lost in a fantasy world fed by music, art, books, poetry, plays, film and TV series, and being generally a bit useless. Yet, there we all were together for my birthday, in my apartment. It was on that day that my evening out on a solo date began. Liz had gotten me some additional bedding and breakfast stuffs. Ruth and family had gone for a throw for the back of my couch and houseplants. Lynn and co went for some kitchen utensils and a ticket to the Lyceum Theatre to see Bluebeard by Emma Rice and her new company Wise Children. I've never been to see an Emma Rice play before, but Lynn has seen several and talked about them many times. They've always intrigued me. What's more, it was the first opening to go to the theatre again in a city full of theatres. It was like welcoming that fantastical world in my head back home where it belongs. The only issue was having to wait until March to go and do it. I kept the ticket in its envelope on the windowsill, next to where I sit every day, to constantly remind me and make sure I didn't lose the ticket beforehand. I didn't need to worry that much though. Lynn was already prepared and sent the link to download the mobile ticket just as I was walking out of the door with the paper ticket still on the windowsill. I've taken myself out on solo dates before. But usually they're during the day and involve cafes and galleries, maybe the cinema. Dinner and the theatre was definitely the most date-like solo date I've ever done and it was slightly terrifying. What's more, it was the first time I found myself missing having someone's company. Conversation over dinner, laughing about something together in the bar before the play, discussing what we'd just watched on the way home. It's strange how some of the things that you find yourself missing about people and relationships are things that never occur to you before as things you'd miss. Knowing I was going to be in the theatre with a lot of people around is definitely an uncomfortable situation for me. Dinner I was pretty sure I was going to manage. It's easier to fade into your own bubble only dealing with the waiting staff. Plus. I'd booked myself in literally at their evening opening time, correctly expecting it to be basically deserted. The gradual filling of the restaurant is somewhat ignorable, and by the time it was starting to bustle, I'd acclimatised, and was leaving anyway. In some ways, the restaurant definitely prepared me for the theatre. What I hadn't realised was where my seat was. The last time I'd been to the Lyceum was taking an ex to go and see Peter Pan, and we were sat near the back in the stalls. So for some reason, that's how I imagined my experience would be, sat in a dark cubby hole of a spot, close to the exit. I was reasonably close to an exit, I suppose, in the middle of the very front row. A fair amount of controlled breathing was needed. 
Once the play got started though, almost everything else disappeared. I was transfixed on the magic. My fantasy mind world being apparently breathed into existence before me in all of its frenetic, surreal, hilarious splendor. For those that don't know Emma Rice, she's been writing and producing plays for a while, all with the common thread of being user patients of classic works. The first of her plays, Lynn took our mother to see, was A Brief Encounter. Mum wasn't impressed by the idea of going to see a play of a movie she hates. She ended up absolutely adoring the Emma Rice version that tells the tale of the side characters of the train station, shoving the tragic romance into the background. This was my first Emma Rice experience, and it was Bluebeard, a story I'm familiar with, but I'm less familiar with the original play. I had considered digging out a version of it beforehand, but then decided it was probably unnecessary for the enjoyment of this version. I was correct. The story of Bluebeard, a vile man who charms women to their death at his hands, is used as a kind of illustrative narrative for this play. The Bluebeard narrative is told by an apparently kooky cult leader of sorts. It is a story being told and performed on stage, while the actual story is gradually eked out alongside. A play within a play, if you like. The whole affair is a hilarious fantasy from the outset. Witty one-liners and characterful, energetic musical numbers run throughout the whole play, as women who lived their lives with a good man until his death enter a life of excitement and exhilaration without fear or trepidation, only for that joy to be turned into terror, violence, and eventual victory. This, in itself, could be a hard watch, except the story of Bluebeard as narrated and performed is a fantasy. The story bubbling beneath this fantastical tale is one extremely remnant of actual events, making the play potentially not advisable for some people to watch, although I would encourage as many people as possible to see it. Gradually brought more and more to the foreground throughout the fantasy being played out, the second narrative is not delivered by the same cult leader character. It has few witty one-liners, and its brief moments of joy are fading memories. The confusion and realisation solidify through these brief vignettes and moments of revelation. The ultimate story is shakily told by a young man, a baby brother, a brother often lost in fantasy to escape what the world wants to make him, a brother that was there for his talented sister's performance and didn't think twice about obeying her request to return home alone, only for her to never make it back.